All right, welcome back. Um, so last time we talked about the finite difference approximations to the derivative of a function or data with respect to a variable. So I want us to just recall um, on this board here. Okay, so last time we did the finite difference approximations to f prime. And we had a forward difference approximation, right? f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x. If we took the limit as delta x went to zero, we would recover the exact derivative. Um, this has error on the order of delta x. So if I make delta x smaller, my error goes down uh, proportionally. Similarly, we have a backward difference. So now we take f of x minus f at x minus delta x divided by delta x. This also has order delta x error. And finally, we arrived at the central difference derivative, where now we take x plus delta x uh, minus f of x minus delta x divided by 2 uh, delta, this is x, not t. And this has order delta x squared error. And this is a very nice thing, because now if I make my dx smaller, my error gets that much smaller squared. Okay, so that's really good. And all of the error analysis involves Taylor expansions. Okay, so the error uh, analysis involves Taylor expansion. And we can presumably get higher order accurate schemes just by using more points. Okay, so we can uh, get higher accuracy So I'm saying we can get even better than central difference um, by using more points. For example, what I mean is um, i.e. f at x plus 2 delta x and f of x minus 2 delta x and f of x plus 3 3 delta x, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so potentially by using more kind of points of data and Taylor expanding these, then I could combine them in some way to get even better error properties. And this is actually discussed um, in the textbook or in the kind of PDF online course notes. So for example, there are second order accurate forward difference schemes. So only using points that are kind of forward, and there are second order backward difference schemes using only f of x, f of x minus delta x, and f of x minus 2 delta x, uh, and so on and so forth, okay? So you can kind of cook up as high of an order accurate scheme as you like, actually. Um, good. Okay, so now we talked about first derivatives. What about the second derivative? How do we compute this for the second derivative? Um, so really what we want now is uh, f double prime. Now I'm gonna switch back and forth between t's and x's and f's and I don't want you to think that this only depends on for functions f of x. This could be for a function f with respect to time. I can compute the second derivative of f with respect to time and the basic idea is exactly the same, okay? So here what I'm going to do um, how do I want to introduce this? So this is kind of a cool idea. So before, remember, we had f of t plus delta t minus f of t minus delta t. And if you recall, based on the Taylor expansions of these, um, all of the even terms were the same sign and all of the odd terms were opposite signs. And so when I subtracted them, the even terms dropped out and all I was left with was odd terms and we use this to form the central difference scheme. Well, here we want a different derivative, so I'm going to add them, and what I'm going to get out is now all of the even terms, okay? And I'm gonna get, so example, two f of t. You can actually kind of expand these out and do this by hand if you wanna verify. We get two f of t plus delta t squared uh, d squared f dt squared. 
plus delta t uh, to the fourth over, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is probably 2 times delta t to the fourth over 4 factorial, uh, d, d to the fourth f dt to the fourth. Oh, there's a class in here. Yep. Uh, d to the fourth f over dt to the fourth at t plus dot dot dot. Okay, order uh, delta t to the sixth. Okay, good. So uh, just a couple of comments here. First of all, we pick up a factor of two on every coefficient. This would have been delta t squared over two factorial, but we're multiplying it. We pick up a term from each of these, so it's times two, times two, times two, and so on. Now, this is actually the term we want, right? We want, well, we want d squared f dt squared without this delta t squared. So what I do is I take this expression, um, f t plus delta t plus f of t minus delta t, <coughs> and I subtract 2 f of t, I don't want that, minus 2 f of t, and I divide by delta t squared. Okay, so this is a central difference second derivative scheme. Uh, in fact, I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit. I'm going to say that this is minus uh, 2f of t plus f of t minus delta t. The exact same thing. I'm just putting the minus 2f of t in the middle so you can see the kind of symmetry here. And this exactly equals the thing I want, d squared f dt squared, the second derivative, plus uh, an error term, which is, uh, let's see, 2 over 4 factorial delta t squared d to the fourth f dt to the fourth plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, so this is the derivative we want, and this is all of the error term. So again, we say the error is on the order of delta t squared. Okay, so this is um, a central difference scheme for the second derivative. And it's kind of interesting. This looks a lot like what we would get uh, if we did just the finite differencing of the first derivative, right? We could approximate the first derivative on the left and on the right or in the middle. Um, yeah, so in fact, this is exactly what you would get if you took the forward difference at f of t and the backward difference at f of t Right, those are two approximations to the first derivative. And then uh, kind of finite difference those. That's exactly what this would give you. Cool. Um, okay, let's see. So generally, let's go back to the, to the left board. So generally, central difference is better when we can get away with using it, okay? Um, this is essentially because of this higher order error accuracy. And in the MATLAB examples we showed, for example, um, forward difference sometimes systematically over predicted the derivative, backward difference would sometimes systematically under predict uh, or vice versa. And central difference kind of balances those out to give you a much, much higher accuracy scheme. <coughs> so this point I wanna make is that central difference is really desirable um, whenever you can get away with using it. And what I wanna talk about now is under which circumstances can you actually use it, okay? So let's just write this up. We're gonna say central difference um, is generally better than forward or backward uh, whenever possible. And I'm putting an exclamation mark here because sometimes it's not possible. Uh, maybe we could move to the right board. Okay, good. So central difference is generally better when it's possible. Okay, so it's not possible when we're computing, 
It's not possible when we're computing f of t, or the derivative of f, f prime with respect to t in real time. So why might this be true? Why is it that we, are, we cannot use central difference when we're computing f prime of t in real time? Any ideas? Well, we actually don't have access. We don't have access uh, to f of t plus delta t because that hasn't happened yet, <coughs> right? We don't, t plus delta t is in the future. We don't have that measurement. We can't compute uh, anything using this quantity in real time. So an example I like to think about is um, the missile defense network. So we have a pretty, um, kind of one of the most impressive technological developments in the US is our network of missile defense capabilities. And we're constantly paranoid that someone's going to try to shoot a missile, say from North Korea, uh, into the US. And we have sophisticated methods of monitoring the progress of objects as they travel um, around the Earth. So we get measurements every dt in time of the position and maybe the velocity. Um, and what we'd really like to do is get a very good estimate of the you know, velocity or acceleration of this thing to predict where it will be. But we can't possibly use a central difference or a forward difference scheme to, to take the derivative of this position. Okay, so you can't use uh, central difference to figure out where a missile, what a missile's velocity is, okay, or what a projectile's velocity is. And moreover, you can't do this, um, you also can't use, or rather it's not possible, when you're working with data at the endpoints. Okay, so if I have a big vector of data, then in the middle, I can use central difference, but at the endpoints, I don't have um, x minus delta x or x plus delta x. So it's not possible when computing uh, f prime of x at boundaries of the x data. And just a little picture I like to draw uh, to make this clear, right? Let's say that these are all of my uh, data points. My boss just emails me a vector of data or I'm getting you know, this live streaming set of positions from some trajectory um, of a missile or maybe an asteroid. Um, in the middle, you know, I have, let's say that this is xk. Well, I have access to xk plus one and xk minus one, right? So I can compute, here this is, you know, these are all delta x apart. So I can compute the central difference at this point, but here I don't have, um, there's no point to the left of this. There's no point delta x to the left of this, so I can't do central difference. The best I can hope for is a forward difference here and a backward difference at this endpoint, <coughs> okay? So there's a chance that this could be a homework where I actually give you a data vector, I email you a data vector, and I ask you to compute a second order derivative for all of the points in this vector. Okay, so you could use central difference at all of the interior points, but you'd have to find a second order forward difference and a second order backward difference for the endpoints. And again, you can find these in uh, the lecture notes or in the book. Okay, um, good, I think this makes sense, okay? <coughs> Maybe I'll draw one picture just to kind of uh, hammer this point home. So similar to the picture that I drew uh, on the right board, we're going to have our function Okay, we're gonna have some function over our domain x, and we're going to have x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 all the way up to xn. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, and we have some crazy function doing its thing. 
But all I know, I don't actually know what this function is called. I just know that it has data points uh, that are separated delta x apart. Okay? So what I'm trying to say here is that x k minus x k minus 1 is always equal to delta x for every k. Okay? These are all spaced delta x apart. So what I'm going to do um, for all of the interior points, I'm just going to make this uh, kind of a red plot. For all of the interior points, we're going to use uh, central difference. And then for all of the exterior points, we're going to use either a forward difference or a backward difference. Okay? All right, so let's actually code up a MATLAB example and see kind of what we're talking about here. Okay? So before, in the last lecture, we actually um, used this sine wave here that we cooked up. We knew the exact derivative. Um, and when we computed our finite derivatives, we actually used the function. We evaluated the function at the points of interest. But that um, is maybe a little bit misleading because that assumes that I have a function to evaluate. Maybe my boss just emailed me data. So here we're really going to take the data-driven approach. Um, and I really like this philosophy. Um, in general, when you have a numerical method or a mathematical method, you should think about what are the least number of assumptions you need for this method to work. And here, I just need data of the same length in time and f, or in x and f. So I'm going to clear all, and we're going to numerically uh, differentiate a sine wave on a discrete grid. And we're going to compare with exact derivative, uh, cos x. But we are assuming that we only have uh, data. We don't actually know that we're dealing with a cos a sine wave. We just have data. Our boss emails us a data vector. Okay, x equals 0 0.1 to 0 0.1 to 3. Okay, I'm going to take, you know, a little bit less than a half period of sine in increments of 0 0.1. Okay, f is equal to sine of x. <coughs> I'm going to plot uh, x, f in black. And I'm going to plot, um, I'm also going to plot red x's just so you can see that, um, that it's actually just data. Okay, let's call this um, numerical differentiation uh, D. Okay, cool. So these red X's are our data, and they do a pretty good job of capturing uh, the general trends in the, the curve, the black curve, which is our actual sine function. Okay, but our boss just emails us the X positions and Y positions of these red X's. Okay, so now we need to, we're, we're only looking at the data. So just data from here on in. First, we need to define a dx. A delta x equals x2 minus x1. Um, I need to know how long my vector is. My vector of data is length n. Um, and what am I going to do? I want to approximate the first derivative. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a vector of zeros um, of the right size. df dx equals zeros of n by 1. <coughs> okay. So remember, we can do central difference at the interior points. And we can do forward difference uh, at the left point and backward difference at the rightmost endpoint. And uh, we're going to have, so df dx at the left point, at point 1, is equal to f2 minus f1 uh, divided by x2 minus x1. So here my, my delta x might actually be changing on the data. I don't really care at this point. Um, this is just f at, so I want df dx at point uh, x1 at index 1. So I'm going to look at the point to the right of it. That's f2 minus f1 divided by delta x. This is uh, a forward difference. 
at f of x1. Now I can do the um, now I can do the central difference. So for i equals two to n minus one, we're going to say df dx at that index is equal to the point to the right of that index. That's f of i plus one minus the point to the left of the index. That's i minus one divided by two delta x, which is x i plus one minus x i minus one. This is central uh, in between. And finally, I need to use a backward difference scheme at my rightmost endpoint. So df dx at my endpoint n is equal to my last point f of n minus the point before it, f of n minus one, divided by delta x, xn minus x n minus one. This is backward diff at f x n. And let's just plot these. So I'm going to plot uh, my true solution cos x in black. And then I'm going to plot my approximation df dx in red. OK. So notice that it's very, very close. You can see only a tiny bit of disagreement. If I zoom in, um, you can see, yes, they are, in fact, different curves. But they're very, very close to the same curve. Okay, And this was just based on this data here and these red x's. Okay, So one possible homework uh, problem that I like to give occasionally is um, notice that in this script, we used a second order accurate central difference scheme in the middle and a first order accurate uh, forward and backward difference scheme at the endpoints. So what I might ask you to do is to find in the, the lecture notes a second order accurate forward difference scheme and a second order accurate backward difference scheme to use for the endpoints. Okay? Good. So that's all I have to say about numerical differentiation uh, in MATLAB right now. <coughs> Excuse me. But there is kind of a cool thing I would like to do on the board at this point. OK, so we talked about error, uh, order of error accuracy. And this takes a little getting used to, thinking in terms of you know, order delta x, order delta x squared. Um, usually, people want to have some coefficients and know, you know exactly what the error is. This just tells you how the error scales. So what we're going to talk about next is this neat idea um, about kind of trying to minimize the error of a simulation. Okay, let's see if I have a good black pen. Okay, great. So, so in principle, how do I minimize uh, the error of these finite difference calculations? Well, um, probably some of you are, are yelling at your TV set that what I really want to do is make delta t or delta x or whatever go to zero, right? Because that would give me the exact derivative. So as um, delta t goes to zero, does the error um, become arbitrarily small? This is a really important philosophical question. It's philosophical because we don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> but we're going to figure this out. Okay, So as I make my delta t smaller and smaller and smaller, does the error become arbitrarily small? How many of you think yes? Okay, How many think no? Well, uh, what if I make my delta t, so let's say delta t is 0.1, and I make it 0.001. Chances are it will make my error much smaller. But what if I make my delta t 10 to the minus 1,000, right? Such a tiny, tiny, tiny number. Then what happens? OK, so the answer is no. This error does not become arbitrarily small. No. Because of what's known as a numerical round off error. Uh, or because of numerical truncation error. Uh, 
Okay, so remember your machine, your um, laptop or your desktop computer can only represent numbers approximately. It only has so many little you know, pieces of, of silicon to hold a number. And so it, any number that you give it, or almost any number, not all, but most numbers you give it, it only approximately um, captures those numbers. And so the current state-of-the-art machine has a round-off error a round off uh, error of E sub R is about 10 to the minus 16. Uh, this is for double precision. And you can watch the um, supplemental materials on, I think it's gonna be called a bit about your computer to see kind of what double precision means and why there's a round off error of 10 to the minus 16. But you can take it for granted that when you store an arbitrary kind of random number of your choosing in memory, it might be only represented within 10 to the minus 16 of the number you actually wanted to represent. <coughs> okay, so for example, if in the computer you said A, um, you had some number A, and you said, I'm going to take A plus this machine error divided by two, your machine would not change A. It doesn't, it can't tell the difference between this it, so this is the same as A to your computer. Okay, so if I just add this tiny, tiny number divided by two to some number I, I want, it doesn't actually change the number in memory because your computer just doesn't have that much precision to represent that. Okay, so this is the basic idea that we're going to use. Um, and we're going to use this to find out that there's kind of a limit to how small I can make delta t, where after I make delta t you know, even smaller, my error actually starts to grow again. So let's see how this goes. Um, I think I'll do this on the left board, just so I can have some space. Okay, good. So now um, on the left board, we're going to say we have some df dt. All right, good. So df dt is equal to uh, f of t, which one am I gonna use? I'm gonna use a central difference scheme. So f of t plus delta t minus f of t minus delta t divided by two delta t. Okay, that's my derivative. And we think that this is equal to df dt plus some order delta t squared error. This is, this is a kind of correct mathematical statement. But what's really the case is that each of these numbers has some machine error in their representation, right? There's some true exact number if I take like sine of t plus delta t and sine of t minus delta t, there's some exact number that has infinitely many decimals. And my computer can only rep represent so many of them. So really what we have um, is kind of in our computer, we have this f of t plus delta t minus f of t minus delta t. And each of these numbers contributes some machine error. So I have plus two of my little machine errors. And remember, E sub R is about 10 to the minus 16. So I have my machine error. Um, delta T technically has some machine error too, but I'm not gonna count it because it doesn't make a difference and it just makes my algebra ugly. So we're just gonna say two delta T uh, plus order delta T squared. Okay, so what does my total error equal? In this expression, what is the error in total? So I have my error is equal to, well, it's equal to order delta, <coughs> it's equal to order delta t squared, um, plus this er divided by delta t. So it's equal to er over delta t plus uh, some constant times delta t squared. I'm gonna actually tell you what that constant is. 
It's m over six times delta t squared, uh, where m equals the maximum value for c in uh, t minus delta t to t plus delta t of the third derivative of f with respect to t. This just comes from the mean value theorem. It's not terribly important, but basically what I'm showing is that there is some number m, some constant times uh, delta t that completely captures this error, and here's what it is. Um, and this is the maximum error. So in fact, my error is always less than or equal to this maximum error. It's maximum because I found the worst possible uh, curvature in my segment, okay? So anyway, my error is kind of less than or equal to this quantity. It has to do with my machine precision divided by delta t plus some constant delta t squared. Okay, so I want to actually minimize my worst case scenario error, right? That's what I wanna do. I wanna choose delta t to be just small enough that this error is really small, but not so small that I'm magnifying my, my machine precision. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take the partial derivative of E max, I'm gonna call this E max, with respect to delta t. Okay, so I take um, partial, I'm just taking the derivative with respect to delta t, that gives me a minus, minus e sub r over delta t squared plus, okay, two over six is one third, so m thirds delta t. Okay, and I'm going to set this equal to zero, right? That's how I either minimize or maximize my e. I'm gonna set this equal to zero. And so what we find out is when I bring this over and multiply by delta t squared, I get um, that my delta t should equal three times my machine precision divided by this quantity m. Um, now this m is having to do with the curvature of the third derivative or whatever. We could just say it's kind of approximately equal to one or 10 or whatever. So this is approximately equal to 10 to the minus five, okay? So for a given kind of badness or curvature of your data, like if it's really wavy, like really high frequency stuff, this is gonna be larger. But if it's gradual, simple data, then this is smaller. And you can solve for the delta t that actually minimizes the error, okay? So there's always this trade-off between kind of Taylor series um, truncation error and amplifying machine round off error, okay? And a good rule of thumb for data is that you can't really do better than this with a central different scheme, at least for m equals one. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind, right? You can't just keep decreasing delta t over and over and over again. This doesn't say that the error is equal to 10 to the minus five. The error might be much, much smaller, right? The error might be uh, 10 to the 10. 10 to the minus 10, which is really, really small. This just tells you that your dt can't be too small. Okay, great. Um, all right, so that is actually all that I wanna tell you about finite um, difference derivatives. That's great, we finished finite difference derivatives. Now what I wanna tell you about is uh, finite, not finite difference, but numerical integration. So we took the derivative of data now we're going to be integrating data, okay? So I'm just going to kind of write <coughs> just a few notes. I have 15 minutes, um, so we're gonna say numerical integration. So we all are pretty comfortable with calculus. Um, so I'm actually just going to write up the formulas and then we're gonna talk about them, okay? Um, and again, this applies equally well to data or functions evaluated at discrete points or whatever. This is just how to do integration with computers, okay? 
So I have some integral from a point A to B of a function f of x, uh, and I integrate it with respect to x. And just like in the numerical differentiation, we started with our kind of baseline definition um, limit. Here, we're going to do exactly what we did in calculus, right? We're going to, um, let's see where I should write this. We're going to do the same thing that we did in calculus class, where we have f and x, right? We're going to look at points um, x0, x1, x2, dot, dot, dot. And we're going to approximate the area under this curve by adding up a bunch of rectangles, okay? So I'm going to add up this rectangle and this rectangle this rectangle, um, drew that kind of poorly, that rectangle, uh, and so on and so forth, okay? This point, this point, okay, now this rectangle, good, okay. And so on and so forth. Okay, so this point is f at x zero, uh, f at x1, f at x2, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is going to be the principle we're using to numerically integrate to start with, right? There's better schemes, um, but this is what we're gonna start with. And what I would like to say is that, um, you know, this is dot, dot, dot up to some xn. So there are n total rectangles. So n is the number of uh, rectangles. And delta x equals b minus a divided by n. Where this first point is a and the last point is b, okay? So we're integrating from a to B, it's just uh, A to B. We're integrating from A to B, and we're taking N rectangles to find this integral. Okay, so this integral from A to B of f of x dx um, is actually equal to the limit as N goes to infinity of my summation, K equals one to big N of now, I'm defining <coughs> these rectangles as um, f of my point A plus b minus a divided by n times k. So when k is zero, I'm at f of a, and when k is big N, I'm at a plus b minus a is just b. Okay, so this goes from left to right in increments of one and b, a, b minus a over big N. Okay, uh, times b minus a over n. That's my, this is my dx, okay? This is kind of my f and this is my dx. And we can also write this as the limit as delta x goes to zero, right? This is also my delta x of my sum of k equals one to n f of a plus k delta x times delta x. Okay, this is exactly the same as this expression. The limit is delta x goes to zero is exactly the same as n goes to infinity. Um, and I'm just saying that delta x is equal to b minus a over n, b minus a over n. Okay, delta x and delta x. This is just exactly the same thing. Um, and this is called the right-sided rectangle rule. right-sided rectangle, okay? Now, there's also a left-sided rectangle, so I could also say that this equals uh, the limit as delta x goes to zero of the sum from k equals zero to n minus one 
of f of a plus k delta x times delta x. The exact same, um, sorry, yeah, the exact same, same expression. This is left sided. And what I mean by this um, is essentially where do you define the height of this rectangle? Do I take the left point of the rectangle or the right point of the rectangle? And as long as delta x is really small, either one is totally fine, okay? There are going to be systematic errors. Um, for example, here we see, uh, I believe that this is actually using a left rectangle rule. This is systematically left out. And then this is systematically over predicted, okay? So there are systematic errors, but as long as my delta x gets smaller and smaller, these will become smaller. Um, let's see, there is one other point I wanna make. So this expression here, these f of a plus k delta x, these are actually just my values of data. I'm gonna call this um, you know, f zero equals f of x zero um, f1 equals f of x1. So for my right-sided rule, this is really the limit uh, as delta x goes to zero of a summation from k equals one to n of x of f of x k times delta x, right? This is really just x k. And similarly with the left-sided it's all the same stuff, uh, just with a sum k equals zero to n minus one. Okay, so this is how you write it in terms of data. My boss sends me data, xk and f of xk, and now I can compute uh, the right-sided and the left-sided approximations to the area under the curve. Okay, so I'm curious. Um, who invented this idea of kind of numerical integration or taking the limit, um, or taking the limit of um, smaller and smaller successive objects to get an, an integral? Who, who thinks you know the answer? Okay, so usually uh, the answer that I get in a live classroom is kind of unambiguously Riemann. Right, or maybe maybe not Riemann, maybe Leibniz or Newton, right? So those are kind of the three names that get thrown around. Newton and Leibniz developed calculus. This is called the Riemann integral, right? What if I told you that this basic idea was discovered 2,000 years approximately before they, they were born? Now who would you say it is? So it turns out that the great mathematician Archimedes actually he didn't develop it in terms of rectangles. He actually approximated areas using triangles that were successively smaller and smaller. Um, but you know, in ancient Greek mathematics, Archimedes actually developed a form of integral calculus so that he could numerically integrate volumes and areas. And this was not an esoteric, uh, just for the fun of it exercise for Archimedes. He was actually defending his home island from the onslaught of the Roman Navy for years. So the Greeks and the Romans were at war. This was the Second Punic War. And they were trying to siege the island of Syracuse where uh, Archimedes was a native. And so Archimedes developed um, extraordinarily sophisticated siege machines. So he would build catapults that would hurl boulders kilometers away and crush uh, the hulls of ships that were approaching. He made parabolic mirrors that would focus the sun's light and catch ships on fire. He even made cranes that would pick ships up and drop them on the rocks. And one of the basic tools in Archimedes' ar arsenal was essentially accurate numerical integration, accurate prediction um, of mechanical systems based on data and formulas that he could derive. And so Archimedes single-handedly held off the Romans for, I believe, two years. Um, pretty impressive stuff, really um, kind of life and death application of numerical methods. It's kind of a cool story. So next time we're going to talk um, 
these are these are really like the forward difference and backward difference approximations kind of they're not that accurate um, next time we're going to derive the error properties and we're also going to cook up a couple of better numerical integration schemes okay thank you that's all for now <laughs>